All right, Hyperfast Agent Nation, we've got an amazing guest today. Not the typical guest you guys are used to. He's not a, not an active real estate agent. He does have his real estate license. He is a pretty active real estate investor, also invests in business, and he is just blowing it up on TikTok. So we'll get into that today. I know a lot of you probably have not used the platform. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you've gone on and you've consumed content but not produced. So today we've got a guest with uh, over 300,000 followers on TikTok. He's just crushing it there. Welcome to the show, Lewis Kim. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Yeah. Excited. I am excited to have you on. Not our typical guest, um, <laughs> but I think that's great. I think we need to bring more perspective, and, yeah. and, and you're doing awesome stuff on TikTok. Before we get into that, though, give everyone your background, your story. Uh, well, I mean, I've had my real estate license for a long time. Uh, in fact, that was my first sort of career out of college in my 20s. Um, I did really well, but I just didn't stay with it. I bought my first business when I was 22. Like flipped it in about ninety days. From, what was that? Um, it's actually it was a franchise, Wetzel's Pretzels. Uh, it's still in Montgomery Mall, but uh, I was able to flip it for double of what we put into it, and uh, that's sort of the path that I took. But I've kept my real estate license, been active, so I'm very empathetic towards agents, and I know how hard it is to go out there. Uh, I mean, this was you know 2001, 2002, so cold calling it was awesome because like nobody was calling people so right um, so throughout the years have been I've you know I've got uh, investments in real estate residential and commercial but also owned other businesses as well um, sort of the gamut and so that's kind of where I am today we're looking actively right now the asset class that we're investing in um, really focused on is a combination of real estate and business which is uh, assisted living yeah I've, I've, I've heard a lot about that I know it's it's been uh recommended by a lot of different people. Like Tony Robbins actually was the first one I heard. Really? That put me on yeah. to assisted living. It's just combining a bunch of different issues and, and needs and, and it, it It's phenomenal because you get the appreciation factor of real estate, right? And you, you, you control a big piece of real estate, um, but it's also, it has the dynamics of an operating business. So you can create margin that's beyond just whatever the market will bear in terms of rents, because you're providing a service. Typically, assisted livings, if they're done well and run well, on the EBITDA number, you should be able to get to about 20, 25%. And sometimes in smaller facilities, you can get as high as 30% EBITDA falling to the bottom line. So they're good businesses, um, but they're, they're difficult. So 25, 25% of, uh, of gross yeah. uh, revenue is, is what you're ending up on your EBITDA? Yeah. yeah you should so for the, those of you who don't know that, uh, that is earnings before interest tax, depreciation yep. as well, and amortization, and amortization. Yep. so all your kind of like non-recurring yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff. Right. Um, wow, so that, that's a that's a pretty good margin for a business that is it's probably pretty scalable, right? If once, once it, it, it is very scalable. Uh, you, you'll see, I think, the industry itself, There's it's very much divided into sort of the institutional guys that are 100 beds and above, right? And so that'll get you your Sunrises, Brookdales, um, they're really big, but then there's uh, a move towards these smaller care homes, which you're seeing more and more, which will be anywhere from eight to 15 beds. And in those, you can get pretty close to that 30% pretty regularly. Uh, and most people in most markets are doing them in residential homes, so. All right, well, let's let's talk about business for a minute or two, just because I know we're, everyone's dying to hear about TikTok and what it is. Yeah, uh, sure. But business, um, You've, you've owned and operated and sold and bought a lot of different things. Sure. Um, what's, what's some advice you can give to real estate agents on how to approach what they do more as a business? Because I think a lot of them never really get past highly compensated, self-employed job. I, I how think, do they get from there to business and what are they, what are, what are they missing out on? So, so having a lot of friends that are agents that do well, um, I think one of the hardest things for most agents making that transition, and maybe you've seen this and experienced it yourself as you all have built the team, is the understanding that um, when you take a role in ownership of any business, there's a bit of this where in order to be sort of the leader, you have to really humble yourself to the people around you, right? And you have to really encourage growth around you. And I think you'll see a lot of agents that do really well, you know, they crush it, and then they try and build a team and they try and scale, but they're so focused on what they can get from these new agents coming in 
as opposed to like what they can provide them, that they don't think about that. Because any business ultimately comes down to people, right? And so whether or not um, you have the right staff in place, the right people committed to the culture, I mean, that's really gonna make the difference of whether or not you, you grow an actual business. Outside of that, you've probably seen this as well, I don't think enough agents spend enough time talking about their numbers. Right. Yeah, so I've heard two things, right? Uh, what, what can they give, right? What value Absolutely. can they give? And then, and then this is the big one I think too is, is numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they can, there can kind of be a, uh, a, uh, a, a push and pull between these two. Absolutely. In some, in some respects, right? But, but if you don't get this right, yeah. You can't do this. Yeah, if you don't have the resources, you can't make it work, right? So, so, what do you think on the numbers front? Like, what are the agents? Are they, are they just not knowing them? Are they looking at the wrong stuff? Or, or I, I, I don't think agents are unique in this. I think agents are like most small business solopreneurs, where they don't know their numbers because they don't understand the value in those numbers, right? And it's understanding one, understanding the gross. Like, if you look at any drive-through business, right? The first thing that they look at is traffic, right? They're looking at traffic because they they can c compute a capture rate based on that traffic. So if there's 100,000 cars a day passing by that location, they can get a 2% capture rate. They know on an annual basis or daily basis how many customers they get through the door. I think it's very much like an agent who has to look at things and say, look, if I want to be an expert or the, the market leader you know, or the mayor of a particular neighborhood, understanding things like, how many homes are there? You know, how much turnover is in that neighborhood? And how frequently do I need to call that area to even get it from a marketing standpoint? But then even within the business operations, once you get revenue, it's like, so what if you make a million a year, right? If you take home 50,000 of that, yeah, it doesn't mean anything, right? You gotta know your gross, your net, yeah, your so, margin. <laughs> so it's, it's just everything. It's along those lines of like your top level gross numbers, and even, breaking it down to the point where like for that business that's a McDonald's that has their capture rate, well for an agent, you know, it's that old tried idea of a hundred, right? Like the hundred contacts eventually lead you to a, a deal, like just knowing those numbers. And in today's world, those numbers I think could be higher or lower based on whatever your, your marketing medium is. So I think it's really just knowing those things in and out. And, and I think also focusing on the core numbers, right? It's like, in, in a drive-through business in a McDonald's, like their key metric is, is time, is time through the drive-through. Because I think I believe it's like 70, 75% of revenue comes through the drive-through. And so every minute that an order takes beyond what they've allocated, it costs them on an annual basis hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And I think for an agent, it's the same thing. If you're not spending your time efficiently in the right areas, producing the numbers, you're just not gonna get to where you wanna go. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I think I remember in business school, they, they kind of taught us how to look at these big, long reports like 10Ks, 10Qs, all this, these long things that, you know, companies put out. And, and then they taught us kind of the Warren Buffett <laughs> method. And it's basically three things to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Margin, churn, and leverage. Like it all, you can kind of break any business down on, on that. Like how much are they making per deal? How many times are they churning and, and what kind of leverage do they have? Yeah, I, I, think, I think being able to identify and simplify whatever the big pictures into the smallest is how you create action and motion, right? So it's like, when I look at a business, I wanna know what is at the core of that business and for me in the assisted living, what I've understood is that the business itself, yes, you're caring for seniors, but the value that you're ultimately providing in the marketplace is you're really alleviating guilt for family members because they feel this sense that they they have to care for their parent when in actuality they can't, right? You can't you can't care for someone 24/7 and and raise children and, and have a job and do all those things. And so that's a key component when you're looking at those businesses and I think in this business as well like you've got to get to the nut of what it is and focus on that, you know, and really understand it. So Yeah, no, I mean we set up a dashboard and and we're looking at I'll just write them up here. Um, and I think you know, any agent really can do this starting out or if they've got an assistant or if they've built out a, you know, a business out of it, right? You, you gotta know uh, on, the, on the revenue side, right? Like your, oops, your, your 
you know, how many deals you're doing, obviously, right? Your average dollar per deal that you take home, right? So if you're paying out other agents or other commissions, right, that, that doesn't count. And then fixed costs, right? What's your overhead, your rent, your, your salary, variable cost, right? If you're doing bonuses or, you know, marketing costs for, for a listing, you've got to know those. And then, you know, more, more stuff you got to know that flows into deals, I would say, are your leads, your appointments, right? And then, and then your conversion on all of these. So, you know, it's, it's not a ton of numbers that you, you need to, to know. It's like less than 10 things, yeah. right? And, and just, just checking into them weekly, right? And, you know, you may look good now, but if, if your leads are down this week, right, that's an indication that maybe in like, 90 days, you're, you're going to be in trouble. If your appointments are down, maybe in 60 days, you're going to be in trouble. So you, you want to make sure you're driving, looking in on the road, not just the rear of your mirror. Like if you're relying just on your CPA, that's kind of like driving, looking in the rear of your mirror because your CPA is going to give you what you did last month. Right, right. Right, and, it's, and, and they're gonna have some of this cost and, and the money you brought in, but they're, they're not gonna be projecting out here with your leads, appointments, conversions. So. Well, well, I mean, in this business in particular, right, it's all leads, right? Like the leads are the start of that cycle. And then how that leads to revenue or eventually ends up in revenue or where you can dissect the problems, right? Because if you know you're producing enough leads on a monthly basis that convert, you know, whatever that ratio is, is 80, 100 leads that lead to a deal, Along the way, if you're not hitting those numbers anymore, right away, you know, am I not doing enough appointments? Am I not converting? There's a lot of things you can look at. And I think that allows you to make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, as opposed to, like you had said, look in the rearview mirror, because then it's too late. Yeah, let's, let's talk TikTok for a minute. And, um, you know, I know some agents are, are using it, some are just browsing it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna Pull, pull yours up here, and I'm sure Kelsey will show this to all the viewers, but um, where is your profile? You're, you're Salty Asian, right? Yeah, Salty Asian, <laughs> the number eight instead of the A for Asian. All right, so, so check this out. Salty Asian, 328,000 followers. 8.8 .8 million people have liked your posts. Like, your latest post, I'm, I'm guessing this went out today. It looks like you were shopping. Yeah, we um, uh, joined 3, a- 3,500 people already have seen. Joined a Facebook group where there are people helping seniors who are sort of shut in because of the coronavirus. So something that I did with uh, one of my parents. That's awesome. And you got like, you know, ones that are cooking, working out, and you know, they're not even a couple days old. They're like 20,000, 60,000. Um, what's, what's the most? likes you have or views I, on I the, think I've got one that's it's 2.5 million right yeah here. I think I've got one that's like in the 4 million range 4 million wow. somewhere in there yeah so I mean that's that's well let's just take a look at this one for that's 2.5 million I'm gonna play it here so you're, you're basically documenting your, your yeah your weight loss journey yeah right? absolutely comparing then and now which yeah this is kind of like the, what Gary Vee was telling people to do a few years ago, like just document what you're doing. And, and Th that's how all like, this started. Did you, know, did you know a year ago that you would be doing these side-by-side -side kind no, of videos? No, not or? at all. Not at all. I just, it, it genuinely started all of this with just workout videos yeah. and you know, various videos here and there. So were these old ones like posted before? Yeah, they, were, they were. Yeah. They were on Instagram. Yeah. Um, I think it was one or two on and YouTube. And you just kind of repurposed them? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so talk a little bit about uh, TikTok and what you're doing there, your, your weight loss journey, or, or whatever, whatever you think would be valuable. Yeah, I think for most people, probably starting with understanding what TikTok is, and to be honest, like I, I don't truly know what it is other yeah. than that it's a platform that is a creative platform, and that today its organic reach is very strong. Right. So all of the, the followers, all the views have all been through their algorithm. And what differentiates TikTok from any other social media platform is that it has, it sort of divides a line between who you follow 
and what they think you're gonna like. And so you've got the following and your For You page. And right now, the For You page has a really deep organic reach. And so there's a huge opportunity to build an audience through the For You page. And if you look at the analytics, almost all of my views are coming from my For You page. I think eventually what will happen is, is as that gets crowded, it'll come from the followers and it'll be harder to add followers just like Instagram and Facebook. But right. today you can get out there because TikTok sends it out, right? And what TikTok does is it's it, essentially, it's a ripple effect where they'll take a video, any video that's posted, and they'll put it out to about 100 followers or 100 people. And when they interact with it, if, if it's positive, then they'll push it out to a wider net and a wider net and a wider net, and that's how things go viral. And so all of that stuff where it's over a million or even in the hundreds of thousands, it's just a direct result of the For You page. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the only platforms where you can have no followers, make a video and get like a million views. Yeah. Right? Organic, like you just, you just don't have that opportunity on other platforms and you know, like, like other platforms it, it, it probably will and maybe already is like start to get, get different in terms of the organic reach or, or not be as much? It, it, is, it is getting more competitive every single day. Yeah. Uh, because I know that formats of videos and songs and combinations of things that I've done even uh, two months ago, they don't have the same reach as they do today. And so it's finding out and doing things cleaner and better and trying to fit the platform more. But if you're an agent trying to grow an audience, I think it, it is a fantastic opportunity in trying to create that voice and creating that niche for yourself. What, what, what kind of content should the agent make on this? I think it's really about, um, so, so when, we're, when I'm producing content, I have, there's a couple of people that we've gotten together and we sort of talked about it and shared, shared ideas. But just from a formatic standpoint, I think most of what you should put out is gonna um, be for the algorithm. So those are things like, like you've done yourself where there's challenges, right? There's songs, there's things that are trending that allow you to get in front of people purely because of the trend. Right. I think those are really, really important. So you get out there for the algorithm, but then it really is finding that voice for an agent, whether it's you wanna be a neighborhood specialist, right? Or you've got something that you're very good at, you know, I mean, short sale or buyer, whatever those things are and work it out. I mean, there's a guy that, I know who's gone from zero to like 80,000 followers in about, you know, two, three months. And his niche is, um, he's a uh, copywriter and editor. And all he posts are, are things on a, you know, like the word of a day. Uh, he posts stuff like grammatical, um, common grammatical mistakes. And, and he's doing very well with those things. And I think agents can apply that sim similar thought process to, to the real estate business. Yeah, we, I, I first used it like a year and a half ago and I made this video. It's just a, someone in our <laughs> office making a, a margarita and it got like 900,000 views and I, I didn't even have like, I, I probably had a couple hundred followers at that time, not, not even. And, uh, you know, I kind of didn't make much more for a while, but I've, I've come back to it more the last month and, you know, I made, I made one actually with Kelsey here. Uh, that was real estate related about what to do when a home comes on the market that 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 your buyer you know has been looking for and this one you know forty thousand views like I would oh uh, that's the run that was one yeah. of the trends right because the run was a trend right uh, right I first saw someone make a run video uh, it was in relation to the right. coronavirus but I uh, right. thought apply it in this way and you know this is more views than I would get on anything I could make on Instagram and I've got 13,000 followers there, or, you know, so it's, it's just a, an opportunity to get in front of more people and to kind of have fun, right? You, you can be a little bit more raw or real or... I, I think the biggest thing is that it, TikTok as a platform allows you to make mistakes, right? Yeah. Because it's so content driven, like 100% content driven, it's about production. So anyone who is, especially if you've got an agent who's a little bit shy about getting behind the camera, and maybe they're not doing Instagram as much as they want, TikTok will give you the freedom to go mess it up and keep messing it up. And TikTok is probably the best platform to sort of do Gary Vee's model of just content, 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 because there's so much stuff going out there that if you produce enough of it, you only need one, right? And my audience, the way it was built, I think the third video I posted got like 400,000 views. And I was just like, oh my God, and then I let it run. And then six or seven videos later, I ended up with like a few million. And it just takes one of those to really stack the audience. And then you'll, you'll just stack 
uh, follower after follower. And so, but that all came through just trial and error and just going out and doing it. And I think it's a good platform to do that. And it's also made my Instagram uh, content better because I'm producing more and more. Right. Yeah, you're, you're kind of flexing that muscle. Yeah. Um, well, if you're an agent and you're not on TikTok, get on there, try it out, make some content, uh, follow uh, follow Lewis. What's, what's your TikTok handle? It's Salty. Salty Asian, but uh, so it's Salty and then the number eight. Okay. S-I-A-N. They wouldn't let me have the other one because it's apparently not PC. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Salty number eight. S-I-A-N, follow him on TikTok. Uh, before we wrap up, what's what's your take on what real estate agents should be doing with uh, coronavirus? Uh, I think they should be doing, um, I mean, what, what you guys have been doing all week, right? Like producing content, right? Producing content, providing value. Uh, and I think that they should continue to try and interact with people, whether it's through Zoom, right? Do anything that they can to keep going. Um, I, I think, this is not the time to shudder. This is the time to go out there and, and be on top of things because it shows your commitment, you know? Yeah, you got you to gotta stay in the game, adapt, overcome, think of new ways to get in front of people. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, you've experienced this and anyone that's been around real estate long enough knows that with any sort of situation like this, there's always going to be those agents that were sort of on the fence about being in the business, right? Whether they were actually in the middle of transitioning. I mean, it's a hard business, right? You, you don't get paid until you do a deal. And so there are a lot of those people that may be on the fence after this will be like, I don't want to do this. That just means more opportunity for the agents that stay and keep going. So, Yeah, NAR, NAR membership at an all, was at an all-time high going into this. So we'll, we'll see what it looks like uh, in a couple months or so. Yeah. <laughs> it just, it just it might more, be different. It just means more market share for the people that are keep going. That does mean that opportunity. So stay in the game. Stay in the game. Uh, Hyper fast round time. Are you ready? All Go right. In with the hyper fast round. Uh oh. For first timers, just quick questions, quick answers. All right. You got? All right. What is your biggest piece of advice to a brand new agent in this market? If you were starting out today, what would you tell an agent? I would say this to any new agent um, that was anytime is find the people that are doing it well and model them, right? And if it means going to be a part of their team, then go be a part of their team. I think in today's environment, it wasn't like it was for me in 2001. Um, you would go into a team benefits you. And even if you don't stay long-term, there's, there's a lot of added benefit. But I would model whoever those people are and then study those people in these tough markets. You know, Biggest piece of real estate investment advice? Because I know you've done a lot of deals. Um, I, I think you don't ever fall in love with a deal. Like yeah. that, that deal's not going to love you back. And so, <laughs> you know, if the numbers don't work, you got to walk away from it. Yeah. You got to be willing to walk. Um, I mean, we, we walked away from about 40 grand in due diligence expenses and a pretty significant tax consequence because it was in the middle of the 1031 because the deal itself, it, it, it would have been bad. Sunk cost is a sunk cost. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Pe people have... That's one people have trouble with, and I, I never have really. Like, um, I don't know why, if it means I've got ice in my veins or don't have a heart, but... Uh, I think you're pretty... I don't know. I'm, I just, I don't give a fuck. Like, if I, if I spent it, but it doesn't make sense to spend more, like, I'm okay with cutting ties. I think it's the ability that, I think that you're, you've probably feel or, or understand that, like, yes, it's money lost, but that's money you can always earn again. And then yeah. rather than chasing, like there's nothing worse than chasing or using good money after bad, right? And the reason we walked away after that 40,000 in due diligence is there was an additional, I mean, there was a half a million in CapEx, there were all these revenue issues around and the honest with what broke out with the, the virus right now and especially the most, um, the people who are most likely to get it and pass away, these facilities were turnarounds and so, yeah. I mean, it, it, it could have been really bad. Because so. this, this has been rampant in yeah. uh, nursing homes yeah. and elderly care, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah like I've, I've, I've only lost money on one real estate deal ever. It was uh, 2007. I'd, I was in Jacksonville with the Navy. I bought and sold a couple properties down there. And like, I made a lot for, for back then. Like I bought a home VA, 180K. <laughs> I got like this new, brand new single family home in Jacksonville in 2003. And no money down. I think I, think I got money back at closing. You know? like, <laughs> um, 
And like two years later, I sold it for like 245. Wow. So like, as a junior officer making 50, yeah, 60 grand. That's huge. That was, a, that was a big hit. Yeah. And then I made, made some money on a rental after that. And then like the third deal I did down there, I put, I put a 10% down deposit on a condo on downtown Jacksonville, yeah. the riverfront. And it was, so it was a $450,000 condo. So I put 45K down and um, uh, it, it, it took longer to build. Than, than originally planned, which on a high rise condo, that's typical. Yeah. Like always add a year to it. Right. And, uh, you know, plan was flip it, but if not, I'll like live in it, but it took longer. That allowed for the financial crisis to, to happen. This was right when the market kind of started to come under. And, and then I got stationed in DC and the, you know, it didn't work for me to live there. And, you know, I, I ended up just walking on the deposit. Yeah, it's it's a smart thing. My parents thought I was crazy. Like people around me are like, you know, I I still remember my mom. Like, what do you get? You'll you'll never get that forty five thousand dollars back. And like, I'm like, yeah, I know, but but um, anyway, so I walked on it, and like, they they must had so many people walking on deals. Like they they um sent me like a letter like a year later. Like, can you please release the escrow? I'm like. Yeah, I'm done. Like, I don't, uh, like you should have done this a year ago. Like, yeah, yeah. And then I, I actually looked up that the bank took that back from the developer and put the value at two twenty five. So, so had I closed on it, I would I would have gone from like four hundred five to to two hundred, two twenty five, two whatever. Right? Like would have been like a six figure loss instead of it was like a it was a forty five k loss. But I got to write it off and then. Here's the deal though in real estate, if, if you have the ability to get in and out or to hold, like if, if, you, if you could have held it through that, you would have been okay, but you, that's a long ass time to have your money tied up. But I, I, I basically bought, you know, I, I ditched that deal. I bought a condo up, up in uh, this area in Arlington. And uh, a year before that condo probably would have been worth 450, 470, 480. I, I got it for 400. Yeah. So like if you're, if the whole market's down you have to, take take a loss on something if, you, if you're getting into another one that's that's a good deal like it's not really a a loss plus i got the tax benefit and you know, i later sold this one for like 60 70k more so like you know that that sunk cost though I'll, that was like one of the greatest lessons for me in sunk, sunk cost and just worked well, out i think it comes from a scarcity mindset right like because yeah. you're afraid that if you lose that money in that deal right that you can't get it back and it's it's the fear of that loss because you walked away from it and you did better, right? And that typically is, is what happens, right? Like you walk away from a bad deal and a good deal comes. It's just, it's the nature of it, you know? I think they've done psychological studies on people and there's this, this loss aversion that people, yeah, yeah, yeah. people will take like two or three times as much risk to avoid a loss than they will like pressing on their gains. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's yeah. an interesting thing. Um, anyway, that wasn't so hyper fast. We got off on a tangent, <laughs> but I think that's a good lesson. Yeah, so, I think so. Um, one last question, what, what's the biggest challenge you've faced and how, how'd you overcome it? Huh, uh, that's one I wasn't expecting. Um, the, the biggest challenge is, is probably coming from a similar mindset as we were just talking about, is we so, sold a business in 2013, 2014, and I was just burnt out from it. And um, in hindsight, should have held on to it, right? Um, because it was, it was at a point it was doing pretty well. And um, the emotional sort of uh, place I went to because it felt like a failure coming out of it. Because if you've ever experienced burnout or if anyone has experienced burnout, like you go through a period of time, you start to get better, and then you reflect on all the things you've done, and it's just not a good place to be. And so just from an emotional standpoint, that was tough. Um, wasted a lot of money, did a lot of dumb things during that period of time. But, you know, that's where I started to gain some weight again and, and coming out of there. But... Having been through that, you know, I know uh, there are a lot of things that I've learned, right? Stronger, tougher, better, uh, looking at things in a much clearer sense. So, I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, coming over cancer, but it's like when you get deep into a bad mental state, I think uh, things tough to come out of it sometimes. And uh, in that situation, something that should have felt like a success was very much uh, felt like a detriment. All right. Well... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. You, you got to pull yourself out when, when yeah. you go to a dark place and um, and just realize that challenges change you for the better if you if you push through them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, 
All right, well, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, that no, was awesome. Me. Before we sign off, if people want to follow you on social media, what's what platforms are you on? How, um, how do they find you? I'm on Instagram, and I am on um, TikTok and Facebook. It's just Lewis Kim, but uh, Instagram and uh, TikTok, it's Salty Asian with the number eight instead of the A for Asian. All right, well, thanks for being on the show. Thanks I enjoyed it. Let's get yeah, a little elbow, elbow bump. bump. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you wanna see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos. I read them all each week, and I select winners to give out hats, shirts, coaching calls with me, and tickets to some of our events. I'll see you next time.